Praise the Lord. We got something to be thankful for. We, every day ought to be Christmas. You know, uh, most of you know I, I'm not a big Christmas fan. I'm not a big fan of Christmas. I wasn't going to, I haven't, maybe next, no, I'm not going to wear my Bahambak hat. I have a Bahambak hat. I'm not going to wear it. But, uh, and the only reason I say that is because most of what passes for Christmas has nothing to do with Jesus. It has nothing to do with anything but money. It has to do with money. But Jesus isn't about money. He's about salvation. And we're thankful. Uh, God announces what he does. He, he's faithful to announce what he does. And what I wanted to do this morning, just look a little bit at the, uh, the announcements. Sometimes we wait a long time to hear from God. But when God speaks, all right, uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to uh, begin this morning all the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. God announces what, he, what, he, what he's going to do. And there's nothing that God has done that is accidental or haphazard. Or everything, everything that has happened happens for a reason, happens for a purpose. We know the story of Genesis chapter 3, how Adam and Eve sinned against God, ate of the tree that they were commanded not to eat of, and how that brought a separation between God and man, separation caused by sin. And what I want to look at, uh, in chapter 3, in verse 14, because we're talking about God's announcements here, and we're going we're to cover like the whole Old Testament, okay, well, not really, but at the beginning and the end, because all through the Old Testament, God repeatedly made prophecies and made promises as to what he was going to do to remedy the sin problem. And it begins right here. In verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou, thou, thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The very first mention of a deliverer, the very first mention of one who will defeat Satan, comes at the very beginning of God's record. The promise of a seed of a woman. And from this point, all through the Old Testament, God made promises and prophecies, spoke through the prophets, gave signs about the one who would come and be the Messiah, or the anointed of Jehovah. Now, turn all the way to the end of the Old Testament, to a prophet named Malachi. He's easy to find because he's the last one in the Old Testament. The last writing prophet in the Old Testament. And look at the very last chapter, chapter 4. And it says this. For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name, the Son of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow as calves of the stall. And as you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet, in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite thee, smite the earth with a curse. Now, from the time that Malachi wrote that prophecy to the time of the coming of Christ, which, by the way, we're going to be turning to Luke chapter 1. From the time between Malachi and the, and the what well, we're going to read here, the announcements of God's plan was 400 years. For 400 years, the nation of Israel did not hear from God. There was no prophecy. There was no visitation. There was, there was nothing, no angelic visit, nothing. God was at work in the, 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 the life of the nation of Israel, because if you study the history of those 400 years, there was a time when Israel rebelled against a, a, a horrible tyrant named Antiochus Epiphanes, and uh, the, the, the Feast of Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights, comes from that, where they, they only had enough uh, oil to burn in the temple. Uh, Antiochus had defiled the temple, and they only had enough oil to burn for one day, but it miraculously lasted for uh, 12 days until they could get more oil to burn in the, uh, in the, in the temple. And, and that was, you know, God had his hand on the nation of Israel, even though he wasn't visiting them, even though he hadn't spoken to them, he had his hand on them, even as today I believe God has his hand on the nation of Israel. Even though they're in unbelief, they haven't built a temple yet, they're not worshiping Yahweh as they, as they should according to the law, but God still has a purpose and a plan for that nation. Those were his chosen people uh, in the natural sense on this earth. So even though they didn't hear from him, he was still active. But for 400 years, no prophecy, no word, no uh, visitation, nothing. And they had been expecting God to do something. In Luke chapter 1, and starting at verse 5. When God decided to speak, he did not go to the teachers of the law, he did not go to the king. He wasn't going to let that king know what was going on, because that king was pretty rotten at that time. Instead, we read, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, this, when it says of the course of Abia, what the priest would do, you know, they had, a, they had a temple and they had a holy place, and there was a high priest, and it was his job to go in, in and out on the Day of Atonement and so forth, and he was like in charge of things. But the Levites, the descendants of Levi, the ones who were called to be the ministers, workers in the temple, they divided themselves, actually King David did this way in the Old Testament, they divided themselves into 24 different, they call them courses here, but we would call them like crews, okay, yeah, if, you know, I know my brother Dale worked in, the, in, in Allegheny Ludlam, and there were crews, you know, one crew, two crews. Well, they had 24, 24 groups of, of uh, Levites who would work in the temple, and they would each take a turn. They would each go there for like a week, and then they would, you know, then another one would come in. And I've read where there, were, where there might have been as many as like 50 people in each crew, and each one had a different job to do in the temple. Every week, there were things they had to do every day. People would bring offerings and sacrifices and so forth. And uh, there, were, there were menial tasks, just cleaning up and making offerings. And they would take turns uh, doing the different, the different jobs uh, in the temple. Well, this fellow named Zacharias, he was one of those priests. He was uh, an old man. He had a wife named Elizabeth. It says in verse 6 that they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blameless. Sounds familiar. Last week we talked about Job and how he, was, he had that, that recommendation too, didn't he? Verse 7. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. Again, that would have been considered a curse uh, for a, a man and a wife to, to have no children, especially no sons. So here's this Zechariah, and he's a priest. And it came to pass in verse 8 that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense 
when he went into the temple of the Lord. They would draw lots as to who would get the various, the different jobs every day. And this day, it fell upon Zechariah to be the one to burn the incense. Now again, I was reading uh, about what they would do there. One fellow would go in and, and, and inside the holy place, if you've ever seen a picture of the tabernacle, uh, the holiest place is where the ark was. Well, that was covered, and there was no ark at this time. It had disappeared. But in, in, the, uh, in the, place, the holy place outside of that, there was the table of showbread, and there was the lamp that would be burning constantly, and there was an altar of incense where they would burn incense continually. Incense would be burning. It was a golden altar. And we read in the Old Testament that that altar, that, that incense, the sweet smell of incense, represented the prayers of the saints. So they kept that burning constantly. They would take coals from the altar on the outside where the sacrifices were made. That's where they would take the coals and they would put them on the altar of incense. And then they would go in and put incense on there and that would be the, the, uh, the aroma that would rise up. So it fell to Zechariah this particular day to go in and to put the incense on the, on the hot coals. One person would have had to gone in before him to clean the old stuff. Another person would have had to gone in him to put the hot coals on the altar. Then it was his turn to go in into this place called the holy place. This is a very important, one of the important jobs in the temple. And when it fell to a person to do this, it was like an honor to do this. So Zechariah, it was his turn to bring the incense. Verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. So here's Zechariah inside the holy place. All the other ones are outside praying. And it says in verse 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord. After 400 years, no prophet, no angel, no visitation, no anything. Here's this old man, this old priest with a barren wife. And he's in there, it's his turn, and it just so happens he's the only man in all of Israel that had the right to be in that temple at that time, because it was his turn. There appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was, what? Trouble. You know, I hear all these people say they get angels visit them. I don't know, I think if an angel visit me, I'd be troubled. Some of these folks, angels visit them and they like, you know, play cards with them. I mean, I don't know what they do. When, it's like, you know, let's go out for, you know, let's go out for a burger. But, but, but when the angel, anytime in the Bible somebody ran into an angel, they got trouble. I mean, here's, here you have this, this, you know, angels aren't little floating little pixies floating around. These are like warrior beings, right? Okay. So when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell on him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. Now, let's read it. For thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and you shall call his name John. Now, Zechariah was an old man. His wife was an old woman. I wonder when the last time was that Zechariah prayed to have a, have a child. You know, I mean, it doesn't really say that, but you've got to think about this. He probably gave up praying years before this because his wife couldn't have children anymore. She was past, you know, the menopause thing. But God heard his prayer. God heard his prayer. How many years? We don't know. But I know it was less than 400. He says, Zachariah, your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And listen to the description of this boy that's going to be born here. Now, Zachariah is sitting here, he's hearing this, and he's, he's troubled because he's in the presence of this being. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Well, if you're great in the sight of the Lord, that's saying something. You can be great in the sight of other people, but that really doesn't mean that much. But when you're great in the sight of the Lord, he says, He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, marking him as a Nazarite, marking him as one that is set aside totally for the service of God. Because if you read in the Old Testament about the vow of the Nazarite, how they weren't allowed to eat, they weren't even allowed to eat grapes. 
They had to stay away from anything that could be fermented. They were holy. They set themselves aside for, for God's purpose. This baby that was born had one purpose in life. To glorify God. The purpose of God. God had him. He is the one. Well, let's read a little bit more. He says, he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. That's something. Ain't nobody going to have to pray over him for two and a half hours. <laughs> he, was filled from the, he, was, he was born filled with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's miraculous. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And listen to this. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Sound familiar? 400 years ago, we remember, remember what we read in Malachi? The very last words of the Old Testament were pointing to this. The very last words, the last time God visited his people, and the first time he visited them in 400 years, he's saying the same thing Malachi said. He says, He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn their hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist had one purpose in his life, and that was to get everybody ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. One purpose. That's all he did. We don't know anything about his childhood. We don't know anything about his upbringing. But the next time we read about John the Baptist, he's out in the middle of the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey, dressed in, in a prophet's garb, and saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's all he preached. He didn't have 500 sermons to go to every time he wanted to say something. He said the same thing all the time. And the people flocked to him because they realized when John the Baptist started, started prophesying, they realized that after 400 years, here's a, a word from God. He's the last Old Tef Testament prophet. He's not in the Old Testament. Malachi is the last one written, writing in the Old Testament. But John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet. So the angel's laying this stuff on Zechariah. He's saying, you're going to have a son. He's going to be solely dedicated to my purpose. And he's going to proclaim the way of the Lord. That fulfills so many prophecies in Isaiah and Malachi and all through the, the prophets. They prophesied one who would come before the Messiah. He's saying, Zechariah, you're going to be his daddy. Now, I don't know how I would have reacted to that. Okay, but here's what Zacharias did. He said unto the angel, I'm too old for this. I can't have a kid. I'm, I, I, how can that happen? And the angel said, well, he says, I'm Gabriel. <laughs> I'm Gabriel. <laughs> Who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> I'm Gabriel. That stand, I'm the messenger angel. I'm the one that talked to Daniel in the Old Testament. I'm Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, you shall be dumb. You're not going to be able to say anything. See, Zechariah gave him the wrong answer. <laughs> he should have said, blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He said, who, me? Angel said, all right, Zach. Here's what we're going to do. Not going to be able to talk for till the child's born. He says, And behold, you shall be dumb and not be able to speak unto the day that these things shall be performed, because you believe not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. Listen, if an, if an angel ever appears, do you believe what he says? <laughs> and the people waited for Zacharias. They said, He'd been in there a little longer than, it doesn't take this long to burn incense. I wonder what's going on in there. And they marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. But they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. He was trying to let them know what was going on, but he couldn't say it. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of the ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife, guess what happened? Started looking for sardines and ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sister, 
Sister, uh, Brother John and Sister Kathy's daughter-in-law is pregnant, and I heard her talking about what she <laughs> Yesterday we were up there asking. You know, she said, she said uh, Zacharias, After those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. How long had it been since they had prayed for a child? Did they ever conceive in their wildest imaginations that even though it seemed like God had cursed them, but he was just waiting to bless them? They were just faithful in doing what they were supposed to do. He was, Zacharias was faithful in fulfilling his, his work, his doing what he was called to do. And the time came. Now, verse 26. Gabriel was busy. Okay. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. We know the story. We've heard it a million times. Of the house of David, and the virgin's name was what? Mary. Behold, a virgin shall give birth and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's from Isaiah chapter 7, 14. Again, we're seeing all these things in the Old Testament being fulfilled in the New as God had spoken them to his prophets. 400 years, no visitation. Now all of a sudden, Zechariah, and now. The angel came in unto her, in verse 28, Mary, and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And when she saw him, she was what? Trouble. <laughs> she got troubled too. If you come in the presence of an angel, you're going to be troubled, especially Gabriel. She was troubled, his saying, and, and thought to herself, what's this? And the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, just like he said to Zechariah, for you have found favor with God. Now here's this young lady named Mary living up in Nazareth. She was probably a young nobody. Nazareth wasn't a, a, really a great place to live. It was the wrong side of the tracks. And she was probably just a little old, pretty little maiden girl waiting to get married to her husband Joseph. Nothing special about her. But for some reason, and I guess maybe God will tell us why, he chose her out of all the young women in Israel. See, I, I grew up in a church that kind of really, really kind of exalted her. And, and when I got saved, my first thing was, well, oh, Mary, yeah, Mary. But you know what? He chose her out of all the women in Israel. There must have been something about her. Now, of course, she was a sinner and needed saved just like anybody else. She wasn't, you know, sinless and they used to say she's immaculate. No, she wasn't that. But out of all the women in Israel, God said, I want her. And he chose her. He said, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled. Uh, verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Verse 31. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Or Yahashua means the salvation of Jehovah. God with us. God with us. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. All Old Testament stuff, all, Old, all through Isaiah, all through Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all Old Testament stuff, all the fulfillment. After 400 years, God's bringing it to pass. And something I've, I saw, you know, I've read this, we've read this a million times, but you know, Elizabeth, who was the old woman, she bore the last Old Testament prophet, but this young virgin bore the Messiah. It was like the old wineskin and the new wineskin. It was like the Old Testament and the New Testament. God used an old woman to bring forth the last prophet of the Old Testament and this young virgin to bring forth the Son of God. Something new. Something, the fulfillment of everything that was in the Old would come forth of this young virgin. 
It says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of the father of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's quite, a, that's, that's quite a, an order for a young woman living in Nazareth. You would think that would have been somebody in Jerusalem or one of Herod's kids or something like that, but, but no, this, this young woman that nobody would have thought anything about was chosen to be the father of the Messiah. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered, which was a pretty good question, <laughs> okay. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. God with us, Emmanuel, Isaiah said. We sing that song, Silent Night, and the very last line is, Jesus, Lord at thy birth. I keep saying this because people get all mixed up about this. When that little baby was formed in that womb, it was completely God and completely man. He wasn't man that was born and became, you know, had God jump on him later. Completely God and completely man. 100% deity and 100% humanity. That's who he was. That's why, you know, what we, lose, we lose sight of that. We, this Christmas time, you know, these holidays that we have, these religious holidays, we turn them into things that they don't have any, really any business being. We're celebrating the time when God became a man and came to this earth to die for our sins. We ought, we ought to celebrate that every day. Just imagine what your credit card would look like if you bought Christmas presents every day. <laughs> it has nothing to do with presents. It has to do with what he did for us. And you know what? We miss it sometimes. We really do. I was, I was watching, there was a fellow, I was watching on TV, there was a fellow, you've, you heard this, this thing recently up in Elwood City, they put a manger thing out in front of the city hall, and this group, you know, Americans Against uh, or Freedom of Church and Staff, I forget what the name of it, a bunch of atheists up in Wisconsin, they decided they were going to come and pick it, but then they saw the bunch that was out there and they decided not to come. But there was a, there was a guy on, on, on uh, I think it was uh, Fox, probably Fox News, and they were talking to this guy, and he, this guy was like the president of this group of atheist. And he says, I'm insulted at the manger. He says, it insults me. I'm insulted that they're trying to tell me I'm a sinner and I need saved. I said, that guy knows more about the gospel than half the people sitting in church do. That's what it's all about. That's why Jesus said he would be an offense. He would be a, a, a stone of stumbling. Because Jesus came, not so we could have a, a fuzzy little, you know, warm, fuzzy feeling on Christmas and get presents and uh, eat lots of food. But he came so that we as sinners could be saved. And see, here's some folks, they don't want to be reminded that they're a sinner. That's why these people, that guy knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew what the gospel is and he's rejecting it. I swear some folks sit up in church don't understand what the gospel is. He came to save us from our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness and make us new creatures. That's his purpose for being here. There's a whole lot of people that are trying to get to Jesus and bypassing the cross. You can't get there. That was the announcement. He said, in verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, verse 36, Your cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary could have said, well, I don't know about this, but like Zachariah, I'm glad she didn't because here's what she said. And Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Mary said, okay, all right. Go ahead. I'm going to have to explain this to my, husband, to my, my, my betrothed, Joseph. All the people around me are going to think I had, you know, done something illegal. God had to send an angel to Joseph to, in a dream to remind him, to tell him that this was, this was God working. Because if, you know, if it, Joseph had to hear from an angel, because what would you think? Verse 39, we're coming to a close. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah 
and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And listen to this. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. When the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, Jesus said that Abraham would have loved to see his day. When all the embodiment, Jesus said this about John the Baptist. He said he was the greatest man that lived up to that time. Over in Matthew chapter 11, you can read it. The greatest man that ever lived. Greater than Isaiah, greater than Jeremiah, greater than Moses, greater than Abraham. Great, the greatest man that ever lived. The greatest prophet. Why? Because he had greater stuff. Really, his, his time of ministry was really very short. And he only had one message. But he was greatest. Because he was the one to fulfill all the Old Testament stuff and get ready for the new. I thank God I don't live in the Old Testament. I thank God I don't have to do the things that they did in the Old Testament to show their faith and bring offerings and sacrifices and have to go to Jerusalem and go to the temple and go to the ark. I'm, I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ was the final offering and sacrifice for my sins. When the Old Testament come together with the New, some folks try to separate them. You can't separate them. They're inseparable. The Old Testament looks forward and the New Testament looks back. Listen. And he spoke out. I'm sorry. Verse 41. Let's read it again. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice, saying, Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believes, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now listen. We're reading this story after 400 years of deafening silence. An angel appears to an old man in the temple. The same angel appears to this young virgin, minding her own business, getting ready to get married. And out of nowhere, God begins to move. I want to ask you something this morning as we prepare to celebrate this season this year. How many of you have felt, have heard the silence? The silence. It seems sometimes that God is silent. It seems sometimes that we go on and we do the things that we're supposed to be doing and just God, I haven't heard from you. It's, it's, been, it's been quiet. No word from God, no visitation, no prophecy, no. Listen, God's heard your prayer. It might have been 50 years ago. God's heard it. He heard Zachariah's prayer. God wants to accomplish just like he did right here. He's going to accomplish his purpose. He's going to do it. And if God, if you feel that God has a purpose in your life, you may have been waiting for a long time. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God is going to accomplish your purpose. He's going to accomplish your purpose. Don't know what it's going to take. Don't know what it is. I can't answer that for you. But with God, all things are possible. What do you think is impossible this morning as we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Savior this year? What seems impossible to you this morning? What have you been praying for for a long time and haven't seen happen? Haven't heard yes, haven't heard no, haven't heard maybe, haven't heard nothing. If you belong to him, you know what? God has heard that prayer. Daniel had to wait a long time. He prayed. Something like 21 days he prayed. But he had to wait. But God brought the answer. God is going to accomplish what he has set out to accomplish in your life. If you want him to. You can either doubt it and he'll strike you dumb. Or you can say, be it unto me. 
but God's going to do what he wants to do. John the Baptist was born. You can read about it later on here in Luke chapter 1. He was born. And when he was born, they asked Zacharias, they said, what are you going to name him? And Elizabeth said, we're going to name him John. And everybody said, oh, there's a, you don't have any Johns in your family. You've got to name something else. And Zacharias took up a piece of, he wrote on a chalkboard, he said, his name will be John. And his mouth was open. And he began to glorify God. Just in closing, just, just, just reading, starting at verse 64, and we'll close with this. Listen to what this Zacharias had to say. He, he had a lesson of being dumb for nine months. And his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue loosed. And he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with... You know how many people are getting filled with the Holy Ghost here? Amen. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. After 400 years... He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. All the fulfillment of everything that was said between Genesis and Malachi was wrapped up right here. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest for you shall go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. What a wonderful gift God has given us in Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ I hope this year I know we get together with our families and I always say this I hope this year we'll have an understanding of what, what Christmas is about what that manger scene is about I hope we'll understand like that atheist I hope we'll understand it's about, it's about our sins it's about the forgiveness, the remission of our sins. He says it right here. It's all about forgiveness, redemption, the cross, the blood. It's not about stuff. It's about what Jesus did to save us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Won't you stand with me as we close? How many have been waiting? You've been waiting. Maybe you haven't heard. Yeah, I haven't heard from God. I've been praying. I've been waiting. I've been trying to do what I haven't heard from God. Father, we ask you this morning. First of all, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that it was no accident. It's something that you had purposed from before the foundations of the earth. That there would be a redeemer to those of us who are lost and sold in the slave market of sin. Father, that you sent your only Son, that whosoever should believe on him shall never perish, but shall have everlasting life. Father, I thank you for these stories we read about these people, Elizabeth and Mary, and these ones that you chose, people who normally, if we were to choose somebody, it would not have been them. We would have, we would have looked around for somebody that we would have felt more appropriate. But you, had, you knew exactly who was going to be there at the time, at the right time. It was in the fullness of time that you sent forth your son, made under the law, made of a woman. And he came here for one purpose, to die for our sins and to buy us back and to make us acceptable to the Father. Lord, help us grab a hold of these truths this year, this Christmas season, as we get with our families, as we bless one another with, with gifts and time and whatever it, whatever it might be. Father, I pray you would reach down and just bless us in a special way. Father, use us for your glory. 
as we go from this place but not your presence, we sing, O come, all ye faith.